let you know how I came across this topic. Uh, well, I came across this topic in the late 80s when France was approaching the, sec uh, you know, the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution. Uh, on the news, people were always saying how uh, France had been the first country in the world to have liberty and freedom and democracy. And then every now and then you'd hear somebody say, no, 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 it was England. It was the glorious revolution a hundred years before that. So I got curious and I started looking into who, who was the first country to have capitalism and democracy and liberty and all the great things that we all love. And, well, before I gave up, before I gave up looking, because uh, if you start looking into that, you start getting lost with definitions. So should we look at the Greeks? Should we... You know, before I gave up, uh, I, I found myself having found an area that interested me, and I kept looking into the area, um, even if I had given up uncertainty and absolutes in history. So I came, uh, in the process, though, I came across, uh, the, I remember that I had studied the United Provinces of Holland. And I was like, well, what are the United Provinces of Holland? That sounds fairly republican. That doesn't sound very monarchical. And... In, in looking into the subject, well, eventually I wrote a paper in college, a small five-page paper. Um, one of the sources that I used was this book by Peter de la Courte and Johan de Guit. And uh, I'll pass it around if you want to look at it. And then here in, in, in Obron, I, I wrote a longer paper, uh, specifically on the ideas that are in, the, in this book, and that's what my lecture will come from, mostly. Mm. Let's see, some historical background that might be pertinent. Mm. And the historical ba background might be a little biased by my personal background. Uh, as you know, I'm from Spain, and, well, at the 14th, I mean, you know, around the late 1400s, uh, the issue of marriage politics was very much in vogue between the different kings. And it came to be that different monarchs uh, married off so that Charles V of Germany uh, would end up having the rule of Spain, the German Empire, and, the, and some provinces in, that included the Dutch provinces. Charles V was an was a, a Dutch person, he felt Dutch, he had Dutch culture, but he became the king of Spain. And interestingly enough, when he moved to Spain, he tried to increase taxes on Spain. And, well, the Spaniards rebelled. And this, these rebellions take place in the 1520s. And when I look into this, I, I kind of like thinking about these rebellions as early French revolutions that failed. So the the nobility and the bourgeoisie of Spain rebelled against a new king that wanted to impose taxes on them, asking for permission. So we had a Dutch king that came to Spain, but we failed. Uh, in any case, uh, Charles V's son, Philip II, he became a Spaniard by education. Um, but, and by the end of the century, uh, well, his rule, he, he was the king of Spain and he ruled over the Dutch provinces, and his rule of these provinces uh, since he wasn't a local, didn't seem such a good idea anymore. And he wanted to do the same thing that his daddy had done in Spain. He wanted to increase taxes on, on the Dutch provinces, and he tried to do so. And this time, uh, the Dutch people could stand up to a Spanish king, something that we Spaniards had failed to do uh, 70 years earlier. So in 1579, the, the Dutch provinces, seven of them, uh, declare independence, and of course, a lot of issues get mixed into this. Uh, the, these provinces were 50% uh, Calvinist, the political leadership was Protestant, and the, the king of Spain was Catholic, so that was another uh, dividing line. But uh, in 1579, they declare independence. In 1584, they come up with their own constitution, which they call the Union of Utrecht. And all that this constitution was is it set up... Uh, you might call it a confederacy, uh, across seven provinces of the United Provinces of Holland. So, uh, starting from the bottom of society, 
each city in, in Holland was ruled by a committee of the local merchants and the local nobles. And these, these committees could send representatives that would form what got called the states of a province. And these states would rule this province. And then each of these provinces, uh, each of these states would send some delegates to what got called the states general of the United Provinces of Holland. But uh, in theory, these states generals could only rule by common agreement of all the parties, of all the uh, of all the provinces, and they only had power over self over, over defense, over the the conduct of the war against Spain, which lasted for 70, 80 years. So, um, in the meantime, uh, they had to, did they have to have unanimous? Uh, that was the the official setup. Uh, and they, they got around, through horse trading, they got an unanimous agreement. And uh, so far, so Republican. What happened, however, is that along this uh, Republican framework, uh, for some reason, Dutch nationalism uh, had coalesced around uh, the, a dynastic figure, the Prince of Orange, the Princess of Orange. And... Uh, these, re these republics had decided to create the figure of the stadtholder, which is the holder of the state, something like that, which by tradition came into the, into the, fe fell upon the, the House of Orange line. And these stadtholders would ha have this role, and over time they ended up having the right to appoint everyone. So the uh, the way that the city councils and the provinces got, got its members wasn't through any type of democratic election. It was either through appointment from the stadtholder or from self-selection. You know, the, when one member died, all the members of the committee would say, well, we need a new, bis a new businessman to take up his place. So the, the lines uh, were a, a bit messy. And throughout the war, uh, the figure of the stadtholder as leader of the armies also uh, started to accumulate more and more power. And that's the basic framework on which uh, these writings uh, take place. So, let's see. What can I tell you? If you are wondering who, who, why should we care about uh, these people, is there, any, is there any authority that tells us that Johann de Guit and uh, uh, Matters, well, uh, you can find him in two footnotes in, in Joseph Schumpeter's uh, History of Economic Analysis, if you care. And Schumpeter, uh, in the footnotes, defines the uh, Guit's ideas as a quasi-system, which, which to him means that, uh, well, if you, if you know the way that the history of economic analysis works, the, he doesn't describe the economic ideas that different people had at different times. He describes the different additions to ideas. Uh, so he, he says that the ideas of these people are very interesting, but they don't add to economic analysis. So that book, is about, uh, according to, to Schumpeter, should have a great place in a book about the history of economic policy, but deserves only a couple of footnotes in his own book. So the... Schumpeter uh, saw some value in the policy recommendations that they put forward. Mm. And about my title, uh, about, I need to keep track of the time, about my title uh, and public choice, mm. well, I will say that throughout the book, uh, well, this author is grounded on the, his ideas are grounded on the tradition of natural liberty. And as a matter of fact, also according to Schumpeter, uh, one of the first lights of natural liberty, uh, um, of natural rights, if you don't go back to Aristotle, uh, is Hugo Gracious, which is, uh, which is that, who is that, and who, uh, and who wrote the basis of what is today international law, it seems. So also this, this book is in, in that tradition. Uh, but in that tradition of natural rights and natural liberty, uh, you get the idea that self-interest might be a good thing, but 
in the tradition, if you come uh, in reading his book, you see things that resemble public choice. Self-interest is a good thing if it takes place within the boundaries of your natural rights. It's a bad thing if it's taken outside of the boundaries of natural rights. In practice, uh, self-interest is a good thing if it works through markets. Self-interest is a bad thing if uh, you have the political process uh, taking things away from people. And we'll see how that works. Mm. And, well, since uh, the point of my lecture is not really to to convince you that he's right or he's wrong because he doesn't have arguments, he has policy recommendations. And the, the point is to say that, look, there were people way back when that held these ideas. Uh, I, gave, uh, I have distributed a bunch of handouts so we can uh, work through some of those uh, quotations. Uh, for instance, in, in number one, it reads, uh, Holland's interest consists in the freedom of all, of, of all its inhabitants the highest perfection of a political society is that the commonality be left in as great a natural liberty for seeking the welfare of their souls and bodies and for the improvement of their states as possible. A power of using their natural rights and properties for their own safety will create an earthly paradise. So, you know, these ideas uh, ha have been around for a long time. And his ideas about natural liberty uh, and natural rights do not involve economics only, or do not involve social liberties only, they, as a true libertarian, if we want to call him that, they encompass basically everything in society. So in, in quote number two, uh, and they, this is a very old translation, so some of the English is a little patchy, but uh, it says, the welfare of the inhabitants of Holland cannot be acquired nor kept but by liberty, da, 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 a toleration of all religions, free bargain right for all strangers, foreigners, to, to move in with us and to follow all their trades and occupations wherever without trouble or molestation from their fellow inhabitants in respect to any societies, companies, halls, guilds, or corporations. And a lot of those things mean monopolies in the context. Uh, and in connection with the political theme, all the things before mentioned are, are not sufficient unless the courts of justice and laws can be constituted and executed more than hitherto in favor of the inhabitants and traffic. Let's see. Mm. Another interesting thing about this time period, uh, which I haven't gotten to that yet, but the time period precisely that we will be studying is 1650 through 1675, is all the, is how many, uh, historical figures that we all have heard of uh, lived at this time. Because, you know, maybe you can pick some quarter of a century where, well, you don't know who the king of France was, where you don't know who the king of uh, that country was. In this period of time, we, we all know everyone. It seems to have been a time period in which everything was happening. Uh, Charles I is decapitated in 1649. Cromwell rules from 1649 through 1660 which coincides precisely with, the, with this time. Uh, Louis XIV is king of France. Uh, at, at the beginning of the period, Mazarin uh, is in power. At the end of the period, Louis XIV uh, will rule alone. And all these figures uh, interact continuously and, and have a great impact on the, on the life of the Dutch Republic. Uh, when... Let's see. Uh, well, I guess I should skip some stuff, given that I'm not going to have the time. Uh, well, I, I introduced you already to the conflict between the monarchical and the republican aspects of the republic. Uh, well, the, this process went through some up, uh, ups and downs. And in 1650, the, the process seemed to have come to an end. Uh, the monarchical forces had completely defeated uh, the republican forces. And this happens with William II of, um, of Orange. And he has put in jail basically every person that wanted to open his mouth. Uh, everything is set great for the future. 
But in something that when one reads about this period happens very often, uh, he suddenly dies. He has everything, he dies of the smallpox. And his son, uh, William III, is still in his mother's womb. So this will give the opportunity for 23 years uh, to have, this will give an opportunity to the Republican forces uh, to, uh, to rule, to, to try to have a Republican form of government. And this is what we will have between 1650 and, and, seven, and, and 1673. And um, as you might guess, uh, the period comes to an end when William III comes of age and takes over uh, the range of things. But at the same time that Holland was a republic, England was a republic, and uh, Cromwell forces Holland to sign a law saying we will never have an orange as our ruler again. So Holland does it. And then Cromwell dies and his son decides that he doesn't want to rule. So uh, Charles II, who had been living in Holland, uh, becomes the king of England. And so, uh, whereas England and Holland were great valleys because they were republics, now they are great enemies. And the same thing happens with France. And uh, all throughout this period, uh, everybody wants to eliminate uh, the republic. And Char uh, Charles II of England will be the uncle of William III. So everything is deeply interconnected. So, let's see. Let's try to see how other ways in which public choice um, appears in his writings. And, well, it's just not too hard to find public choice written all over the book. Because, um, let's see, in quote number six, you can read, it is contrary... Uh, They quote number seven. Yet will not the courtiers who govern in their stead neglect to seek themselves and to fill their coffers within war and peace. The public is not regarded but for the sake of private interest. In other places, uh, we can read, it is very oft evident that most men naturally are inclined by all imaginable industry to advance their interest without regard to hand, seal, oath, or even eternity itself. And if you can read it in even more partisan terms elsewhere uh, in the book, you can read monarchs have neither religion nor honor, just interest. Mm. These are just uh, these are general criticisms, not necessarily focused exclusively on the monarch. Uh, these are uh, the book attempts to be. At, at the same time, general and specific for the case of Holland. So the, the attack is in every form of concentrated government, but particularized in the case of, of Holland uh, often. Mm, let's see. Also, uh, in reading uh, Dr. Rickland's uh, book on mercantilism, uh, one comes uh, realizes that, uh, well, at the time period, they didn't have income taxes, they didn't have sales taxes. Uh, efficient forms of taxation were less available. So if the government wanted revenues, it had to get revenues through uh, all kinds of ways. And normally the way that it did it was through granting monopolies uh, for, for different type of activities. And uh, what happened in, in Holland, though, as we saw, there was a very decentralized power structure. And the stadtholder had some powers, but wasn't an absolute ruler. So the stadtholder found that he didn't have the power to, to give grants, to give monopolies. He couldn't raise revenue in that way. So what will end up happening is that the stadtholder needs to look for two other ways to raise revenue. And interestingly enough, the way that they will find to raise revenue is war. 
the, the war that takes place between 1579 uh, for 70 years against Spain. Mm. Let's see. So the, the war ends um, oh. 1650 when the... No, the war ends, uh, yeah, a little before that. About the time that the king... Uh, the war ends a little before that, and uh, we'll see later that the that that the war didn't need to last as long as it lasted, at least according to to many uh, to, to tax traders. Uh, what happened? Um, well, we'll we'll get there in a second. Uh, so, for for this author, it's clear that the continuation of the Spanish War was clearly a matter of self-interest for the monarch. In quote number eight, you can read, these Netherlands provinces were in perpetual war, and the reason of it is very evident. The interest of such lords is often different from that of, of the common people. Uh, yet, have they very many persons that depend on them, and are of great power on the government. Uh, that, that it goes on. So basically, um, through the pretense that there's a war that needs to be fought, uh, the stadtholder that doesn't have the right to grant monopolies and, and then obtain revenues will convince all the provinces to give it taxes to fight the war. And we'll say, we'll continually say, this war is very important, we need revenues here to fight, uh, mm, to, uh, to obtain this territory, so on and so forth. All throughout the book, uh, you have continuous attacks on the venality of, of dynastic kings that want more territory. And the argument is almost made, or probably completely made, that they don't want the territory for glory. They want the territory because in obtaining the funds to fight that war, they obtain funds that they can divert for their own court, and so on and so forth. And when they have funds and they pay soldiers uh, and they pay courtiers, all the courtiers and all the soldiers become interest groups that will lobby society uh, or, or the person with the power to raise taxes for the continuation of the war. Mm. Thus, in quote number nine, you can read, officers, courtiers, idle gentry, and soldiery, knowing that under the worst government they used to fare best, they cry up monarchical government for their private interest to the very heavens, those bloodsuckers of the state and indeed of, man of mankind, dare to speak of republics with the utmost contempt, because they know no, none will punish them for what they say. And actually, throughout, uh, elsewhere throughout the book, uh, there are comments about how in republics you have freedom of speech, and you can have the opinions that you want, and it's almost like a Weimar Germany argument. Uh, in, in republics, you, everybody has the right to talk against the republic. Hence, you know, and we have to live with it because we value freedom. In monarchy, in monarchies, nobody that has any common sense will speak against the monarchy because if they do, they, they either will take, get grants taken away from them or simply they will be put in jail or killed. Mm. And, well, in quote number 10, simply, uh, we are told, I, I won't bother to read it. Well, actually, it's kind of interesting. It, uh, in quote number 10, the patriotism of the Prince of Orange is almost attacked because it says that it makes sense for him to covenant with the enemy of this state for particular profit to obtain as much as he possibly could. So it's in his interest to continue wars. So even though it seems that Holland has been winning the war for, for much uh, longer than... I mean, Holland had been winning the war for many of the last years of the war and it seems that Spain was actually imploring for peace, offering all kinds of peace deals, saying, look, we'll give you this, we'll give you that. And as it says in quote number 11, those offers were often were as often rejected by the deputies of the generali generality at the instigation of the Prince of Orange. And in the room, our taxes were continually increased. So it, it looks like the, the monarchical forces in Holland were a party of war that used its patronage to gain, uh, to gain the allegiance of different, uh, mm, of different sectors of society. And 
if you look into the details of, of Holland, it's well, Holland, uh, I mean, of, of the United Provinces of of the Netherlands. Uh, well, I, I would I should explain that the United Provinces of the Netherlands were made up of seven provinces, with Holland being the largest and providing 60% of the revenues. But they only had technically one vote in the in the in in the, in the common government. Obviously, they probably had more influence and some influence uh, related to their size, but legally they only had one vote. So um, if you can obtain 60% of the revenues from one party and, and, you, and you want to, to have tax revenues and you want the political process to pass those tax increases, uh, it, it seems rather simple to try to convince the other six provinces to increase taxes and have the, the province of Holland, which was the trading province, the, that did the most trade zone, so forth. The other six provinces were mostly rural. Uh, if you channel funds from taxation on the province of Holland to the other provinces, you will continuously get votes in, fa in favor of higher taxes. And as a matter of fact, it got to ridiculous levels. Uh, as you can see in, in quote number 12, uh, the, six the six other provinces remained in default of payment without being compelled to bring in their promised proportions because our Captain General had rather, by such favors, keep the other provinces at his devotion, and especially the deputies of the Generality, that by them he might be able perpetually to overvote the province of Holland and make them dance to his spine. So basically, uh, uh, what the dynastic rulers were doing is they were getting the political process to increase taxes on the province of Holland. Nobody else was paying those taxes. And... Uh, Taxes were being diverted there, and everybody was happy, except the province of Holland, obviously. Uh, I, I think I don't need to explain that this, the writer, the author is from Holland. Pro that's probably clear to everyone. Uh, okay. Let's see. There are all kinds of details uh, of how public choice can apply. In quote number 14, uh, it, it presents how tax farming took place. Is everybody familiar with the idea of tax farming? Uh, well, it seems that it, it became, it, it was perfected into an art form. Uh, and it was perfected into an art form in a way that profited the state the most because the right to, to, to farm taxes, uh, well, people had to bid for it. So obviously, the, people had to pay the government for that right. So the government was getting the most possible. It, was, it didn't even have to have its own tax agency. It could rely on entrepreneurs to tax people. Uh, Are they taxing land or business? Or uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's somewhere in there. Uh, there are all kinds of numbers. Uh, it's amazing how much was written on, I guess it's Europe. Uh, if you want to research this topic, you can take any detour and start looking more deeply into William II, William III. Uh, I mean, this is just a prime minister for 23 years, mm -hmm. and there's unbelievable amounts written. I mean, at least four or five biographies that, that we have in the, in the library. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, let's see. So in any case, we, we saw that in, in 1650, William II died the smallpox. So mm, uh, there's a chance for a republican government. And one can look into it and taxes fall and they start to pay the debt and all kinds of policies that favor trade get, get, put, get put into place. But curiously enough, uh, well, the, the army starts to be taken care of a little less and, well, given that everyone around you is a dynastic power interested in a military expansion, uh, those high ideals might have, might have proved to not be such a good idea. And in, uh, by 1672, uh, well, Holland has to fight several wars. And in 1672, the, the French and the English both at the same time attack Holland. And in the process of doing so, mm, well, a mob will kill the wheat. And uh, William III will 
will be installed as that holder and the midnight summer stream comes to an end. Uh, let's, see, let's see if I can tell you. So England and France invade? They invade, and in the process of the invasion, everybody starts saying that the grid is awful, that if we were led by a monarch, this wouldn't happen to us. Mm -hmm. And he becomes, he is killed by a mob. And if you're into gruesome reading, I can entertain you. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I skip stuff here and there, but... Uh, well, this, this starts where they have already been killed. The burghers continue to shoot into the dead men, cheered down by the crowd of about a thousand. Uh, this is about the killing of the grid, obviously. Uh, da, 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 those who looked on with horror had still... Uh, da, da, their cor corpses were next dragged to the scaffold and hung by the feet. Uh, what was not planned was what followed in the crowd had been not only burghers, but also the rubble. For them, the mere killing was not enough. They ran to the scaffold as soon as the civic guards da, 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 beginning the desecration and violation of the dangling corpses. They stripped the bodies bare, cut off parts, including the genitals, slit the bodies open, and pull out the hearts and entrails as if they were sl slaughtered cattle. Da, 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 da. Uh, the parts were steered them, quails. Da, da, uh, Okay, and then it says, there is no parallel to this cannibalism in all of that history. Uh, and another interesting detail is, uh, I explained how the political leader... So far I've been talking about republican and monarchical elements. Uh, the republican elements were for freedom of trade, so on and so forth, equality before the law, but they weren't for democracy, necessarily. As a matter of fact, uh, they despised... Uh, the rubble, as, as it says in the book, and mm, let's see, and the rubble despised them. So, uh, as a matter of fact, the, the majority of the people were in favor of the prince. The majority of the people saw the prince as their defender uh, against uh, these rulers. So, it's somewhat hard to place ourselves in, a, in the spectrum of what was going on at the time. If you are for uh, free enterprise and so forth, you probably, uh, and for intellectual freedom, you probably would find yourself siding with the Republicans. But at the same time, you know, the, the picture is somewhat mixed. Uh, well, wasn't, wasn't this period, of, excuse me, of the Republican government? Wasn't that a period of tremendous prosperity? For the it was mostly because people uh, went into dying in wars. Um, yeah, and it was a period of prosperity. Let's see. And so, well, the grid, uh, in, at some points in the book, we go, it goes into, into what would be the ideal form of government. Monarchical government has negative points because of these tendencies to concentrate power and to, to, to try to rent six and so on and so forth. And think, he presents a few arguments to, add to, you know, to give theoretical backing to this. Thus, for instance, uh, he says in 16, mm, we shall always find it true in all countries governed by a few aristocratic rulers and provided uh, with but few unrequited annual magistrates that a great person obtaining their any power in the government or militia will easy, easily draw to its party all rulers and magistrates by the most considerable and profitable offices and benefits which he can offer. Hence, the, more, the fewer people that are in government, the easier it is to bribe them. So, uh, and along those lines, uh, he will advocate having large uh, assemb assemblies holding power, and this also is aligned with Eklund's analysis in his mercantilism book, uh, because um, 17 is hard to read, but basically what it says in 17 is that if you have an, as an assembly with a lot of members, uh, then it's, hard, it's harder to get to bribe that assembly. It's the, the, the larger an assembly, the more costly it is to commit bribery, the less uh, bri bribery 
the, 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 up, the efficient optimal quantity of bribery will go down, so we will be better off. Same thing takes place for in, in, in the courts of justice. Uh, monarchical justice uh, had few judges. Uh, the, uh, Republican justice adds to the number of judges so that it's harder to, to bribe them. And that's in quotes 18 and 19. In 18 it says about monarchical justice, they publicly sell justice and none that are wrong, they're complained. Uh, let's see about monopolies. Well, he, he has a he covers basically all the arguments that we have against monopoly. Uh, I guess I should try to wrap it up quickly. But uh, let's see. Twenty one private or peculiar profit is the chief foundation, though it always goes under the notion of a general advantage society of all those restrictions and burdens imposed on the citizens by corporations and guilds which serve to no other end but to keep good people out of their cities and in the meantime uh, to give the members of such corporations, unions, whatever you want to call it, a lasting opportunity of being enraged by their fellow inhabitants and of selling their goods and manufacturers more expensive to their neighbors. Uh, so, you know, the basic analysis is already there. And the way that it worked it, at the time is if you wanted to sell certain products in, in a city, you had to live within the city. It was illegal for you uh, to move into the city. Mm. And, well, the, uh, the grid is against all that. Uh, in, qu in quotes number 23, and I, I guess I'll try to run through, in case you are ever interested in reading this on your own, I'll just tell you what they are about. Question number three is about, is about the issue of whether uh, regulation of the quality of products is good or whether uh, quality will arise uh, on its own if the market is left alone. Is left alone. And in 23 and 24, by another author, you basically see that they already realized at the time that the purpose of a regulation for quality is to keep away entry and that further, I don't know how much it goes on today with the FDA, but at the time, in, in 24, in the case of England, if you had a seal of quality for a product, it basically became a tax because you could basically purchase those seals of quality without that meaning anything about the product. Uh, so, and actually... Uh, in doing, in, reading, in doing this research, I, I ran across uh, an English person complaining about England, saying, how are we so inefficient in England? This regulation of quality works so great in, 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 in the Dutch Republic. Their products are of su such high quality. We're trying to impose quality through government, and it's not working. I mean, what are we doing wrong? Uh, another detail that reminds me, is the origin of the word mercantilism uh, seems to have uh, at root when people refer to mercantilists they were referring to the Dutch merchants that basically operated under the regime of free markets and when Franz and Colbert realized that, Fran that the Dutch Republic was such a great mercantilist nation Colbert decides that he he's going to beat him at mercantilism and he's going to get the state to help in doing so. So that's how the word mercantilism becomes perverted. Originally, mercantilism means merchant. Yeah. And so mercantilism is a policy to attack merchants? In, uh, after Colbert. Uh, even though Colbert probably didn't mean to. Who knows? Uh, in quote number 25, basically, uh, this is interesting. It is certainly known that, the, that this country cannot prosper but by means of those that are most industrious and ingenious and that such patents or grants, monopolies, do not produce the most, a, the most ablest merchants. But on the other hand, because the grantees, whether by da, 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 uh, think that they need not fear others uh, who are much more ingenious and industrious than themselves, shall lessen their profits 
Before the certain games, the rip become dull, slow, inactive, and less inquisitive. So if you have Monopoly has dynamic effects. People st start innovating less and less. Quote number 26 takes it to the ultimate. It gives an example of fishing in Greenland was monopolized. Nobody was making, the company wasn't making profits. It was closed down because it was obviously not a profitable monopoly. And then people started going on their own privately. And well, it turns out that Greenland is a great place to fish. So they're still hoping monopolies. They are so bad that they might become this man on their own. Who knows? Let's see. Uh, he, throughout the paper, uh, one of the lines in my paper was that Smith said this, Schumpeter tells us other people said those things before. So at some point I was comparing Smith with, with him. And if one reads Smith, Smith argue, seems to argue that charters and monopolies might have been not so bad an idea, but they became corrupted. Well, uh, the way that I contrast it is that the wit will have none, none of that. Uh, charters are not something that may become corrupted, but are rather an in instrument through which the monarch's self-interest is further in violation of everyone else's natural rights and liberty. Um, and I, if anybody's interested, I think I could find the line in, in Schumpeter. Uh, I want to always put those. Quote number 31 talks about the right for everyone to live where they want and to practice the professions that they might want. Uh, and this is best for everyone. And I don't know if it's in any of his quotes, but uh, he's basically in favor of international freedom of movement of labor. He says that this will benefit uh, society, obviously it will benefit the, the trading class that will hire workers. And in number 32, he makes an argument about a bar backward slope in supply of labor. Let's see. Uh, we see that for want of strangers, foreigners in this country, the peasants must give such great yearly and day wages to the servants that they can scar scarcely live but with great toll themselves and their servants live rather in too great plenty. So if you allow foreigners to move in, we wouldn't have this problem. Uh, so, you know, wages need to reach an international equilibrium or something like that. Uh, quote number 33 is about incentives. For he that sits idle in Holland must, must expect, expect to get nothing but certain and speedy poverty, but he that ventures may gain and sometimes find out and meet with a good fishery, manufacture, merchandise, or traffic. And so it goes on. Quote number 34 uh, recognizes that in the freedom of labor, we, somebody will get hurt, uh, and though this, the entry of foreigners, will be ever detrimental to some old inhabitants who could have all the profits and bereave others of it, and under one pretext or other exclude, ex exclude them from their trade. It is notorious that all people who to the prejudice of the common good would exclude others, and for that end would have some peculiar favor from the rulers beyond the rest, are very pernicious and mischievous inhabitants. So, rent seeking is bad. Um, well, I could go on. He, he basically presents all the same arguments for international trade. So, uh, I guess I'll open the floor for questions. Before. Uh, let's see. Uh, Rousseau's book uh, is from 1633. And <coughs> I don't know. I mean, there's a book that's uh, about everyone that influenced. Uh, as I explained, uh, the, the way that the political process worked is, is was through cooptation. Uh, when somebody died, each 
ruling committee could pick someone else. These people got chosen from some families. And so the debate was, do we have one prince or do we have all these families ruling? Nobody was advocating more democracy. So one guy outside those families wrote to this book and he was advocating greater democracy. Now this book came into the hands of the Guid and the Guid uh, toned down the parts that he didn't like, uh, changed things here and there. Um, but in any case, uh, these are basically not figures in economic thinking. And they, they had these ideas. They, they didn't come up with them. So the, these are probably the ideas that everybody, the beliefs that everybody held in Holland at the time. In the merchant class. In the merchant Sorry. class. Uh, I don't know, but at the time everybody traveled extensively. Like this guy, he, I mean, he's, he got his law degree, and then his dad sent him traveling around Europe for two years to become cultured. So he he basically met all his enemies uh, personally when he was a uh, you know when he was in his early twenties, and then later on in life, well. He has memories about all his enemies that he would eventually fight. He met Louis XIV when Louis XIV was a little kid. And Louis XIV would eventually cause his death. Um, so, oh, where, where was I going? Uh, I get lost. Oh, anyhow, he, he's, he traveled extensively, so it seems that everybody did. I mean, not everybody, but the, the culture of people traveled extensively. He spoke Latin and, and French. Seems to be what everybody else did. And I have here. Let's see. According to Schumpeter, Smith's natural uh, ideas of natural liberty have many sources. Some of them could be those of Sir Joseph Child, and Davenant, and Paul Spain. Paul Spain is a guy from Sweden. So, you know, the. The intellectual community was far more international than it seems to be today, interestingly enough. What language was that? Dutch. Dutch. And it, it, this is translation from you know, the 18th century. So that's why it has Fs all, all over the place, like the Constitution. Dutch. Dutch. <laughs> to draw a parallel. Okay. Uh, so. so it was written in Dutch. I mean, it was, uh, if one reads about the period, there are a lot of pamphleteers that put forward policy proposals without backing. This is basically a very long pamphlet. Because, I mean, as you might have noticed in, in, in the quotes, uh, the government is bad because the government is bad. Which, if you think that the government is bad, then you agree. But he hasn't put forward any solid argu arguments why the government is bad. It's it, it's a book of persuasion. It's not a book of theory. Was it was it the case that the the original author was couldn't publish it? Uh, the, the way that the, the original published the original author was a nobody. I mean, he was a uh, textile person, mm -hmm. but he couldn't publish it. So the book ran into the Guid's hands, and he was like, "Oh, this is interesting." So. Uh, some way or another, he basically got uh, copyright rights and, uh, and the right to, well, intellectual property rights are interesting, I guess. I guess at the time, if somebody got your book, they could copy it, and you couldn't get royalties. So uh, there was no point in publishing a book mm -hmm. if you weren't going to make any money off of it. So what, what he got out of the grid was the, uh, a patent for the book. You know, the, all these monopolies are weird. Uh, it turns out that this monopoly, that's, this type of monopoly, might be good. So it's the only it's a, it, what it is is if somebody sees your book uh, and it doesn't have your patent, then you can go to jail because you didn't prison because you didn't uh, pay your due property rights to the to the guy that wrote it. If transaction costs are too expensive for him to, to sue you, whatever. You know, a lot of a lot of the quotes that you gave out indicate that this that these fellows were 
certainly classical liberals, natural rights theorists, uh, pretty good economists. Uh, but uh, in terms of the title of the talk, did, was, was there any concentration um, on, you know, the, the political um, aspects of, of the Republican system in terms of the voting between the provinces and the, mm. you know, did, did, did they concentrate on that or was that just... Well, uh, I didn't expect to talk so much about history and background in my talk. I mean, there's a lot more here. Uh, but without giving you the background, nothing makes sense. So I needed to give you the background. So it goes into into more detail. I could have spoken much more on how it works. And the, the basic idea is that uh, a concentrated form of government, since everybody, the point is, everybody seeks his own health, self-interest. So we need to create a form of government where the interest of the government of the ruler are tied to the interest of society. So we need a government by the traders and a government with many traders so that they cannot be bribed. In, uh, and if you have a government by a single individual, that single individual is going to find it profitable to bribe everyone and to seek patronage and to, have, and to limit everybody's liberty mm -hmm. through these taxes and patronage. So he certainly had the, uh, as, as you quote, Mentioned, I mean, he certainly had the the unifying force of, uh, or the organizing force of self-interest. Yeah. I mean, but the, the idea is that the key idea, self-interest, is not good. Self-interest within natural rights is good. Self-interest outside of natural rights is not good. Uh, have one quote basically about military service. Uh, Another topic near and dear to your heart. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the military service was voluntary, curiously enough. Every, every, somebody tried to do it compulsory once, but it didn't work. So everybody got, <coughs> to be a soldier, you got saved. Uh, let's see. Somewhere. Uh, <coughs> Well, there's one quote where it is basically said that, I mean, it's basically the Declaration of Independence uh, a few hundred years earlier, is that you ca uh, nobody can take, nobody can tell you, you may die for me, and they misuse that, the government cannot do that, and if they misuse that, then you have the right to rebel uh, against the, the, your government. Pretty powerful stuff. I wish I could find it. It's here somewhere. Well, that's okay because we're, we're all out of time, yeah. I'm afraid. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. Yes, and thank, I, you. thank you very much. Appreciate it.